All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to the 127th episode of the Get Down Podcast, brought to you by Digital Music Pool. My name's Cream. Gary W. here. Back after a one week off. You know, we uh, we need a little break, but uh, new episode, lots of topics. Gary and I were just scrubbing our email from all the uh, the notes we've made of, of various topics that we want to talk about here moving forward. So the um yeah the week you know the week off is needed during the summer. Uh, also, I, I've been catching up to the podcast that I've been listening to as well, which is good. Um, I feel like it's kind of a thing that goes on across the board with podcasters. You know, the summer gets a little more lean uh, since people are traveling a lot. So, yeah, a lot of vacations. I mean, we're seeing it in our in our clubs right now. It's a little lighter out there, but that's because people are traveling. You know, we have record numbers of people traveling uh, abroad right now after you know, after being locked up for COVID. So. You know what's wild is that today is the first day of school down here. Really? How crazy is that? I, like Holy I was in, cow. I was in Epcot last night. It was dead. There was nobody there. I'm like, what is going on? First day of school. What first was it? August seventh today. First day of school feels like real. Feels one oh seven. How about That's that crazy. for your first day of school? That would That's suck. That's crazy. But uh, yeah, it just that just hit me. I was like, yeah, people are traveling, but Southerners are now not traveling because everybody's going back. Well, I think part of the reason why we didn't record last week was you were coming off a big travel week, and it seems like you've been like coming up to New Jersey from Florida, like what in what seems like you know every other week at this point. And you know, we had a lot of conversations offline about all the travel and how much how much of a toll it takes on you. And and I know, you know, I'll, I'll let you get into it, but I think you you get, went back to Florida kind of in a in a tough spot mentally and just physically and just beat up from all the travel. I, I think this is, you know why, and I'm, I'm not afraid to talk about like the struggles because that's kind of why we have this platform uh, is to kind of educate people on what goes on behind the scenes. So, you know, I, I know it's really an unsexy topic and sometimes a scary topic for some people to talk about mental health and physical health and things like that. But being in the game for so long and doing this grind for so long, especially like when I was teaching, it was seven days a week, as I've stated numerous times, and now it's the travel up there to to work because um, I don't I don't gig down here I don't gig down here in Florida I gig solely up there because I get to go in and see our owners and our managers and appease them by playing sets in their venues and um, being able to to talk to them about you know how business is and what the project projections are moving forward and what they like and don't like etc. But I, I found myself in a position lately, now that we've been growing rapidly and doing more events for DJs and, and with DJs and just, you know, whether it be the meetup or now we have this new party starting. And I have found myself up there. It was eight. I've been up there eight weeks out of 11 weeks, which means I haven't been home like really at all in three. In, what is that? That's three months in three months. Like it's been. A week here and there kind of a thing. A week here and there, on and off planes constantly. And then I'm fitting in the things that I want to do. Like, went out to Colorado for a little bit. Um, so, like, it, you're, it's you're not been a, You're not one that has, like, days of rest. You're, you're like, a constantly on-the-move type of person. You've always been that way. And, yeah. And it's a family thing. I get it from my grandfather. My uncle's like that. They, 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 they were never TV watchers. They never set still. And that's, that's where that comes from. Um, but... I got back. Actually, let's let's go before I got back. So I was I was out in Jersey, July, mid July, and I was leaving, and was approached by one of our venues and said, "We want to fly you out to play two gigs." I thought they were kidding. I legit thought they were joking. But then I saw them again and again, and they said it again and again, and they had said it to you once, and I, I still didn't take I, I didn't take it seriously. And then they're like, listen, I'll, we'll pay for it. Book it now, and, and we'll pay for it. I said, okay, well, that's, that's fine. Because I, I had done a, a gig in their venue to where they did, I think, two or three X their best night pre, prior to that, right? So I think that they saw value in having me there. Go well, ahead. Yeah, not only are you bringing more revenue to the table when you DJ their rooms, but it's a trust factor, right? This is a brand new venue and they're really trying to get it going and they want the best people in there. They want the people that they trust the most to be playing their venues, especially on the really high leverage weekends. And this was sort of like their, it was sort of like their launch party to like let people know, hey, we're really focusing on doing nightlife here. And this was, they, they invited a bunch of influencers and people from Jersey City and Hoboken that 
you know, we're going to drink and eat and hear great music from you. And they wanted you to be that person. They did something with their venue that's unique. Um, I, maybe not super unique. I, I've seen it done a few times, but I really liked it where they opened up uh, and then worked out the kinks as they went along for the first couple months. And then when the owner felt like it was time, he's like, okay, I'm done. I put my finishing touches on the place. It's finally the way that I envisioned it uh, from the inception. Um, he was like, let's do the grand reopening. He didn't say, they didn't call it that, but they did a really, they did a pretty good social media push and they did invite out, like you said, some influencers and, and people that are um, important that were going to bring some people uh, to the venue. Um, so they felt like this was a very important weekend. It just so happened it was two weeks after I got home from a four-week stint there. Right. And I was looking forward to nothing but getting home and being home for like six weeks. And that was in my mind uh, for a lot of the time, especially that last week. I didn't fly back from Colorado to home. I flew back to New York to play more gigs, which was a mistake. Um, but you, you got to learn from that stuff, right? And then – they were like, okay, we're going to have you back out in two weeks. And I'm like, shit, I really, really don't want to do this. Like, it was in my head the whole time that I didn't want to do it. Um, and then when I got out there, it was like, oh, I really don't want to be here. And I didn't take a positive mindset going into the weekend. And it spiraled into being way too much drinking, way too much partying, not sleeping enough, not eating, not even not eating right, not eating. Just like pe not eating, period. Like I think I did, did – we did Sushi Lounge Friday night. Yep. Excellent meal. Big shout out to them. Um, and then I don't think I ate again until Sunday night maybe? Maybe? It was – I watched like pure Gary W. spiral mode from – It was the, bad. From the minute I left you on Friday till whenever you got back to Florida, which was what, Tuesday afternoon? So – so I miss my flight Sunday because I'm supposed to go from my gig Saturday night to the airport. I don't do that. But they wouldn't have let me on the plane anyway, to, to be dead honest. If I would have showed up, they would have told me to go home. So it was probably good that I missed my flight. I got to the airport that morning at like 9 a.m. Like, we got something Tuesday morning. <laughs> Motherfucker. It's 5 a.m. Tuesday morning. I'm like, all right, fine. I'll be there for that. I caught a show. So instead of, like, relaxing and doing nothing on Sunday – you just compounded bad decision after bad decision, pretty That's much. A, you know, I was because I was misery. I was a misery. I was a complete and utter misery. It was a misery from the minute I showed up, and then I missed my flight, and I was even more miserable. When you and, told me you were getting on a train to go to South Jersey, I was like, "Oh boy, Gar's in a in a bad spot right now." <laughs> Worse than that, I went and had brunch. So I finally had another meal after sushi lounge. I went to Bin Fourteen, threw down like a bottle of wine there. At, like, 11 a.m. Like, bad decision. Terrible. What, like, what are you doing? Like, probably, probably still drunk from the night before. And then got on a train to go to Asbury Park. Like, terrible. Like, no rest. Like, no let up. Like, th think, think I'm doing rock star life at, like, 25, and it's like, that's not the case anymore. Yeah. So, I, I, let's, let's, like, let's pack this in real quick. So, right. you know, Gar Gary's been going through it, had this really rough weekend. And we wanted to talk about it on the pod uh, from a, a couple different angles. So, for, from first and foremost, let's talk about how if there is a gig or a venue owner or someone that approaches you and asks you to do something that you really don't want to do. Maybe it's a venue that is just below, you know, the level that you want to be playing at. Now, this wasn't the case uh, right. in this particular no. venue. But no. just to kind of help everybody that's listening, you know, if somebody approaches you and is like, hey, we want you to play our venue really badly, but it's like a place that's not that great. How do, how do you approach those situations? How would you have approached this situation differently with a venue that we work with regularly? How would I, I think mentally preparing prior to leaving uh, home would have been a little better and putting a little bit more of a positive mindset on before I had left. I think that, yeah. would, have, that would have helped tremendously. And like try to look at the positives, right? Because we always talk about how venues don't appreciate their DJs and they don't appreciate their entertainment. And in this case, they very, very, very much appreciated, you know, me as a DJ and the trust that we have in the work. Right, appreciated you so much that they wanted to fly you up specifically right. to play that gig. Right. So instead of looking at that as a as a positive and being like, oh my god, this is so n nice of them, this is amazing, they really appreciate the, they really appreciate me as a as a DJ and an entertainer, and, and they want me there. I was looking at it as I just want to be home. I don't want to be here, and it was a total wrong way to look at it. So I think right. setting myself up in a positive mindset before I left would have proven uh, better 
throughout that weekend. So I, I just went into it wrong. Yeah. Um, it, I, I'm going to let you talk about another way that you would deal with this. Cause if you're going to, I think your mind state when these situations are, uh, you know, get a pro or get offered to you, you have to say to yourself, am I going to be miserable in this set? And if so, is there a dollar amount that would make me not be so miserable? Because as DJs, we're passing and get, we're passing energy back and forth, right? If we're giving off this, like, I don't want to be here energy, the crowd is going to feel it. Staff's going to feel it. Ownership's going to feel it. They're not going to make as much money. It's like, what's the point of even taking the booking? You're just running through the motions. And I think that's the worst possible thing that you could do. So I think it's, all right, would I ever play in this room or at this place? If the answer is no, then you would just have to tell them no. And you could either be upfront about it and just say that, hey, I'm not taking bookings or I'm not available that date or I, you know, I don't think this room fits with my brand or you make up a story and be like, Hey, I'm, I'm booked. I can't take it. You don't want to make somebody feel badly about their venue or whatever. And then number two, if, if this is something that you're remotely considering taking, I think it's okay to be like, well, what's the big number that I'd be okay with flying up from Florida or taking a night off from playing a venue that I really like playing to take this other gig. To me, it's like, if it's something that I don't want to do, I'm throwing a huge, huge number out there so that if they do say yes, I look at it like, all right, well, I just got this massive number to play a place I don't want to play. Like, it's business, right? I'm going to go work my gig. I'm making a lot of money. Let's think positive. Let's prep for the gig. Let's do what we would normally do for any booking. I so think a, that's, how, that's how you got to look at it. I think a lot of DJs get stuck in situations where, listen, we're all DJing. We, we all do this as a job, right? We're doing this to make money. Um, so in those situations where you get thrown into a gig where you just have to, you're just looking to make a paycheck just as like, I got thrown into this gig. Like I had to do this because it's a, a venue that we're very close with and we have a great relationship with the owners and there was no saying no. Right. I told so, you, you didn't have to do it. I felt like I needed to do it because you I was like, a, you had I to. was approached by both owners multiple times. Yeah. Um, so not only that, but like when you're in a situation where you're picking up a gig just to like make the rent for the month, like sometimes you will walk in and you're not going to want to be there, but you have to be there, right? Because you have to make your rent. Right. Um, a lot of DJs that are full-time DJs have to go work, whether it's a place they want to work at or not. So a lot of people are getting put like, you know, you and I sometimes are often um, a little jaded because like, you know, maybe we've, we've had longer careers and maybe be a little more financially stable. Whereas, like, some of these young guys, as you know, when we were 25 and 24 years old, like, you're not as financially stable. And you're, you are DJing uh, gigs that you don't want to DJ just for a paycheck. So how to walk into those gigs with a mental, a positive mental state um, is, I think, important to highlight here as well, right? And that might be, you know, find those favorite people in the room. You know, maybe it's a bartender. Maybe it's somebody on staff. And, like, DJ for that person. Play, like, get, play like songs that they want to hear and like establish a rapport there to maybe make the atmosphere a little more fun, especially if it's like a little bit of a slower gig. Yeah. Um, I think doing little things like that can turn around uh, a day or a night. Usually these are like day shifts that could be a little slower or any night shift that might be slow. Same thing. Or find, find a patron that might request a song. Like rely on requests uh, when you're a little bit down on playing a gig, right? Just really lean into requests and be like, because you know what? You could establish that rapport with that patron, and maybe they become a recurring customer or a fan of yours and follower, and you know that could spiral into something bigger. Um, I think all of those things can turn a, a negative gig around into a positive. Yeah, I mean, you well. gotta you gotta be a pro, right? You're a pro DJ. You're getting paid to be there. You gotta you gotta be there, and you got you're, you have to be there physically, mentally, emotionally. You gotta just be there and be in it. And if if you are, you're gonna you're gonna play a better DJ set. You know. You yeah, just I don't, are. I, I don't think my for it. Put a put a folder together like you would do for any other big gig, quote unquote, right? Even if it's one that you're you're putting a folder together because maybe it's new music or some some genres you don't normally play or just something to keep you interested and excited as you start the set. And then once you get going, you never know. You're you might have an amazing night, you know? Like I prepped really hard for my sets that that weekend. It was it, they were predominantly country sets. Um I played a lot of country the first night, and then the second night I got to be really more open format. So it was nice to kind of set the tone for the venue. I feel like that's kind of how it's going to go moving forward. Um, and it was exciting to play all of that new music and, like, rock a room uh, to that new genre. That And, and I, I found a lot of redrums, a lot of fun stuff. Um, so I, I wanted to be there to DJ, 
it wasn't that portion of it. It was the travel portion. So I, so let's kind of talk about like we all want to be travel DJs, right? Everybody wants to be a travel DJ, and and now you've been traveling a, a decent amount too. Um, let's talk about how difficult that is and how wearing it is, and what what do we do to not tire out and not to burn out, right? Because I think that when we play locally, it's 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 kind of hard to burn out, right? Because like it's pretty easy to get to the gig. You kind of know your market. Um, you know what you're walking into. Whereas when you're traveling. There's a lot more involved with it, whether it be a three- or four-hour drive, whether it be 40 minutes to the airport, two-and-a-half-hour flight, getting your bags, and then taking a 40-minute Uber. You know, like, there are a lot of stressors that come with traveling and DJing that has nothing to do with the DJ portion of it. Um, so, like, what can you do to uh, alleviate the, the, stress, the stressors? Yeah, the the travel thing, like you said, everybody wants to be a travel DJ until you actually are a travel DJ. And, you know, I'm not doing it even as much as some other people that are doing it out there. They're on flights every single weekend. Uh, I have a pretty pretty stressful or just a high-intense travel month here in August where I'm playing. I'm in different cities every single weekend this entire month. Uh, And I sort of set up my summer that way so that, you know, I could get some of that in, but I also was able to take some time off and it it just worked out. But I I think first and foremost, protecting my sleep is like the number one most important thing. Mm -hmm. And that's when planning travel, you know, I'm, I said to you, I'm not taking that 5 a.m. flight ever. Like I would rather pay some extra money and be able to get on the 11 a.m. flight. So at least I could get five, six, hopefully seven or eight hours, but at least like enough sleep that I'm not a complete zombie because If I'm a complete zombie getting on the plane, I already know my set that night is not going to be very good. So protecting my sleep and and planning my travel around being able to lock in as much sleep as possible is the most important thing. Uh, I think next would be eating healthy. You know, like if you're traveling and you're not sleeping and you're eating like shit, that's just another level of not feeling very well, not having energy. We talked about that a little bit with – uh, with nine, and just because I asked him, like, how, 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 what are your even eating habits on the road uh, when when he's with Paulie D? And he was saying, like, you know, sometimes, sometimes it is picking up fast food, and nobody likes it because it kills you, it kill, it zaps yeah. your energy. It's just not good for you. Like, so yeah, keep eating healthy, keeping in mind eating something healthy, and and keeping a steady diet while you're traveling is is super super important. The worst thing you could do when you're traveling is get super drunk. Like literally the worst <laughs> possible thing because you're dehydrated from the flight. Yeah. You know, you're getting dehydrated from the drinks. You're probably not drinking enough water anyway because you're traveling and you don't have your water bottles in your fridge or your cooler or whatever you would normally do to stay hydrated. So again, it's just like you're you're starting in the negative if you're not doing some of these this stuff. And then just like if you can exercise, some exercise, getting out in the sunlight, walking around. Like it's all stuff that's just going to help you feel better. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are all things that I try and think about prior to and while traveling, for sure. Yeah, it's – you don't realize what kind of effect not doing those things. Like if you don't think about that stuff in advance and it starts to compound, it can spiral really quick. And, like, you can be exhausted – and not have energy when your set comes along, and that's why you're traveling is to is to do, to have your set and, and there's to work. nothing worse than I've had a couple of these in the in the last six months where I get to my travel gig on let's say Saturday night and I had already like a late night, not a lot of sleep, and then a tra- a flight or a drive, and it's like oh my god, I'm I'm like going on at midnight, I'm tired and my eyes yeah. are glassy and I need extra coffee, and it's like it's just not good, you know? And I just never feel like my sets are as good when I go into them feeling like that. It's, it, it's hard to rebound. You can't rebound from it. That's, that's the part of it, right? It's the scariest part is when you walk into the DJ booth and be like, my energy is kind of zapped, right? It's very difficult to rebound from that. There are ways to, like, you know, what feeding off of the, uh, the crowd, once a crowd builds in a place and there, there's a little bit of a, right. There's energy in the room. Then, then you're fine. But it's like, it's getting that set started is, is the difficult part. Something we all probably, not all of us, but a lot of us rely on in these like, I'm really tired moments, caffeine and alcohol. And both of those things are going to make you feel even worse. Like the caffeine and the alcohol are both going to affect your sleep. You're not going to sleep as well. And then you're, you're, again, you're in a deficit the next day. 
they're short term fixes, right? It's it's good for it's good for when you're DJing. It's bad for the other end, especially if you have early gigs the next day or you're doing doubles the next day or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um it, it's 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 tough because like guys say that they want to be travel DJs, but then like some guys like they don't want to take more than two gigs in a weekend because they're like, well, I'm going to be beat, I'm going to be tired, and they don't want to take three gigs in a weekend. It's like, well, you're never going to get to that point of of traveling if if you know you don't kind of feel the effects of of doing the local stuff kind of heavy. I, wanna, I think I, I want to peel the the curtain back a little bit and let's talk let's talk about your specific situation because you and I had after this really long weekend that you had, I knew you were going through it. And on Tuesday, when you finally were home, it might even be Wednesday morning after you were able to, like, get a full night's sleep and, like, get your life together. But, like, we were going back and forth on voice notes, and we're just like, I'm just, I was just saying to you, like, dude, I knew you were, you were hurt, and I knew you were going through it. And I'm like, here's the things that I would have changed if I were you to maybe not be in such a tough situation, you know? Right. Right. And it, it was some of the things that we talked about, you know, I, it was com- it was then compounded by my five hour delay on on Tuesday too. When you're you flying, no breaks at all in your travel at all either. So no, no. I, I, well, I had a five a.m. because I got switched to a five a.m. flight for nothing. JetBlue, you know, hooked it up for that. That was fine. And then I got there at five, and they were like, "Well, you're not taking off till ten 30. I'm like, "Oh, Jesus Christ!" Um, and then by the time I got home, I don't live close to the to the Orlando airport. So by the time I got home, it was it was later in the day, and I was just shot out. And and that's when we we talked the next day, and I was like, all right, well, this is what I'm going to do, you know, once home to to kind of get back into shape a little bit. And it was a little bit of of what we've talked about. And I think when you're not gigging to keep a healthy lifestyle, because we all know that the bar industry. And the nightclub industry, the nightlife industry, is a difficult and unhealthy place. And it's the reason why a lot of people don't have longevity in their careers is because addiction's a hell of a thing, right? Whether it be drugs and or alcohol or whatever it might be, um, that there's a million different things you can get addicted to in the, in yeah. the nightlife industry. Um, so when you're not in those situations, and I've learned this later on, it's something that you've probably taught me more than anything is to, you know, eat healthier and definitely and, and working out is definitely a big part of it because like if you don't feel good about yourself, you know, in those off hours, it's going to be hard to perform at a high level when you're yeah. supposed to be on, right? So like I've been detoxing, like I'm going on my 7th day of detox, eating super healthy and, and and whatnot and I feel about a billion times better. And I'm going to take a lot of notes on like these are the things that I need to do to be successful traveling moving forward. Um because when you when you have rough weekends like that, it's just it's mentally draining, and then it also becomes really difficult to want to go back and DJ. Yeah, right, because it becomes a burnout thing. This is something that I I went through when I played basketball at a high level at a young age in, in high school. It's just like you just get grinded down, and you don't ever take a break to like relax for a second and think about just anything. It's always that one thing, and you're going, going, going. It's like, well, you don't want to burn yourself out. This is what we do for a living, you know. If you can't make money, then what are you going to do? It's taken us, like, think about it, you know, we're, we're, we've been in the game for a while, and it, it's taken us a long time to be able to recognize, like, I need a day today kind of thing. I said it to you all last, last week because I, I rarely work Sundays, and I worked a gig last Sunday, and on Monday I was like, I just need, I need to go lay by the pool and read and just decompress and, like, you have to listen to your body, right? It's like I, you know, I woke up and I knew I just didn't have, I didn't have the mental edge to be able to sit down and do what we do at a high level every day. As far as like building our business or you know working on certain aspects of the business that takes takes time and takes takes brain power. I think from like for the young guys will probably listen to this and be like, you know, they could shake it off pretty good. I, I was pretty good at like just shaking off rough weekends and, yeah. and get, get going back to my teaching job and and then just. Having that and then and then going back to DJ the following weekend. I think as you get older and you're in this game for for longer, these are the things that you need to kind of look out for and, and be careful of. Right. Don't let the one bad day turn into the weekend of a ba- of a bad weekend. Right. You gotta you gotta just get back on track sooner than later, and that's the best way to to combat all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's. Something we talked about in the last episode, too, like if you're dealing with stuff personally, don't drag that stuff to work and don't let that compound into, you know, into more issues. Um, try to separate the two. I think we talked about that last week. Try to compartmentalize, you know, personal stuff and then work stuff because yeah. it's 
Because once you start to kind of jumble all that, it's just it's a horrible recipe for disaster. Yeah. So I, the conversation you and I had, I, I wouldn't call it like a coaching call. It's two friends talking and talking about how we can better handle situations, right? Or like what are the things that we can do to get through the travel and the, 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 the tough weekend or whatever. But you, I, I want to transition over to like talking about, to our DJs and some other DJs that are want to work with us and just like being coachable and being able to have these conversations and making them productive, right? It's like the people that are uncoachable will never, ever be successful. It's it's kind of funny because, like, yeah, you, you had to show a little tough love in, in like, one or two, uh, you know, voice notes. And it was like I could have just easily been like, well, he's just trying to, like, he's talking down to me or something like that. And I was just yeah. like, well, this is just this, – this is really good advice to take. Let's take it all in, and then let's let's figure out how to kind of – does this work here? Like, can I institute it in, in into a positive way moving forward? And I feel like that's kind of where everybody should be at um, when somebody's trying to give you advice. I don't think that, especially if it's somebody who's like a mentor or a, you know, like I said last week, a professional sounding yeah, board. Yeah, just somebody you respect. Um, you just have to kind of t- take it take it in stride and and try to try to make a positive out of it, out of it. it it's because if you're not coachable, like you're never going to grow. Right, you're gonna stay stagnant. You're gonna stay kind of where you're at in life and where you're at professionally. Um, being like stubborn, I was stubborn last week. That's actually I said that I said it while it was happening. I said it to somebody. I, I go, I, I texted Doug actually. I'm like, I'm purposely being stubborn today. Like I knew it, and I still was like just going against going against <laughs> it, you know. But like that's never. It, it's that's the worst place to be at when you're in a bad when you're in a bad place, right? The train was rolling down the tracks and the brakes were not working whatsoever. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, but so like when you're getting, if you have a bad set or if you're late for a set or if I, I don't know, you had a negative interaction with an owner or a manager, like the person that you talk to that's trying to give you advice after that, it's important not to be stubborn about it and to shut down, right? If you if you did something wrong, accept that you did something wrong. And we, I talked to a DJ over, I don't know, it might have been two weeks ago, but they were just like, "Yeah, listen, I got no excuse. Like I screwed up, you know." And I I respect that and I love that. And that's that's the attitude that you need to have because some, you got to be able to say when you screwed up, and then you got to be able to listen like to to the person who's been there or who's maybe your boss or whatever the case may be of. How to avoid those negative situations, right? I'll, I'll give you a great story. It happened last August. I, we, had a, um, we had a DJ not show up two weeks in a row. Same DJ, not show up two weeks in a row at a venue. The owner calls me. He's like, Gary, what's going on? He's like, I don't understand. How, how you can just not send somebody two weeks in a row? You're killing my business. And I just said, you know, I just told him, like, hey, Listen, I, I reached out to this guy. I trusted that he'd be there. He didn't show up. There's nothing I could do. Like, I, I apologize. That's on us. That's what I told him. I said, that's on us. He should have been there. I don't care if, you, if he's known him. He knew him from the past. But I'm like, I don't care if you've known him from the past. It's, we take full responsibility as the bookers, and I apologize. And it'll never happen again. If it does, you can let go of us. <laughs> and he literally paused, and he's like, I have no idea how to respond to that. I thought you were going to give me some bullshit excuse. Yeah. He's like, I have to respect it. He's like, I'm not going to fire you guys. He's like, the, the, it happens, I guess. But he's like, I just don't let it happen again. He's like, yeah. that, was an honest, that was an honest answer. Thank you very much. And, that's how, and it ended on such a positive note. Instead of being like, oh, well, he was late, and he blew his tire out, and he had to clean his right. car and whatever. It's like, you know, just take responsibility. I think that was a great moment in our business of where it's like, just own it, right? We got to own it. And we have to... We, whether it was our DJ's fault or not, it's, uh, it's on us, right? And if we just own it, and you guys as DJs, if you just own it, people are going to respect you. And maybe if you did something that is fireable, they're not going to fire you if you just own up to it and be like, listen, I screwed up. I'm not, it's not going to happen again. Like you said, yeah, you're going to go way farther answering questions or, or you know, having conversations with owners that way than – you know, my alarm didn't go off and my car broke down and my Uber was late or the train was delayed. Like, nobody cares. We all know when people are lying and when they're stretching the truth. and Because we've all been there. We've all been in these situations. Like, or you and I have been in these situations. And this owner in particular has been a bar owner and he was a DJ 30 years ago. So, like, we, we've all been there. We all know 
everything that can happen will happen at right. some point. Right. And um, <laughs> so he just respected the honesty. And that's, and that's the best thing you could do, guys, for sure. But. All right. You want to get into a little music here? Yeah, I would love it. So I, I was scrolling through TikTok and, you know, this is poor podcasting because I don't remember who, what video I saw or who did it, but it was another DJ that has a lot of videos out there talking about the industry and nightlife and kind of coaching DJs. And they basically said there has never been a bigger gap in what DJs play at music festivals than what DJs play in nightlife, in a nightclub right now. This statement scares me a little bit because of the way our market is structured, um, being that we are so open format. So I, I know that like when I was going to festivals more heavily, I would still try to pull in some tracks from there into my DJ set, and it will work sometimes. But I feel like that the music has gotten the, like the the music has gotten so deep and and sometimes so dark and sometimes so dirty that like it's very. It's very difficult to to put into uh, an open format set, especially in a, in, in our market. Um, I don't know if that's across. Is that across the board? Would you say like the predominant amount of venues across the country are more open format, and that's why it's not as translatable? I don't know. I I do think there are in many cases rooms that are that are open format, right? Where you got to play a little bit of everything. And that's going to be more standard than the, oh, this is a EDM house club or this is yeah. a hip hop club. Um, they do exist and they do happen. Can you name one of those in our market? Because I, I can't. No, I mean, no, no. Not, there's like, there's traveling parties in our market, like in like Brooklyn and and pretty much just Brooklyn ex exclusively in Manhattan. Well, yeah, like but, at the Mirage and some of the bigger, some of the bigger massive venues will have an artist sets, right? Marquis going to have whoever, somebody, Steve Aoki. Right, right but He's like going to play all the EDM. Local DJ sets, it becomes a little more difficult. But those, but again, like those big artists that are going to play those places that are also playing the festivals, like those are the only rooms where you can play like that. Yeah. Where there's, you know, the, techno's way bigger right now, right? deeper, darker, 132, 134 BPM. Obviously, Tech House has been big over the last few years, and, and that's kind of predominantly what's getting played at a lot of the festival shows, at least uh, in the EDM world, right? I mean, yeah. uh, you're right. I'm not going to as many festivals as I once was, but I am on a 1001 track list looking at what artists are playing because, like you said, I think it's important for me uh, as a local DJ to be able to take what's happening and take some of these bigger records and take some chances in nightlife. You have to, you have to at least try to sprinkle in some of this stuff. And, you know, you see Rick wonder do it. And Rick is at the top of his game right now. His new track is fire. By yeah, his way. new track is just, fire. Just throwing that in there. <laughs> but I, I think people, this, this, this is going to be such a long convo because this goes back to DJs not taking enough chances in nightlife and just playing like, What's been, what's working, right? It's been like this: the Black Eyed Peas acapella over whatever, and the. It, I it's like just the, what works, right? It's just what I, works. I like the calculated risk. I like the you know what? Play the song without the pop. Play, don't play the pop remix of it. You know what I mean? Like or like the the pop mashup of it. You know, play the the straight up original. Um, but like then you got to follow it up with a with a pop remix yeah. or a pop mashup. I think that that's kind of how you need to go about that. A lot and of what's you, happening in the open format world is like the the mashups, especially in the EDM world. So like all these mashups have just taken over the edits, and it's like there's not a lot of original music getting played in in nightlife. Right, because it's it. I you know who I bl I blame ownership for a lot of this in in a lot of places, but it's also in part the the crowd as well for like not reacting and not you know not being open to to new music. It's it's a hard balance. It's very difficult, and it takes talented DJs to balance it correctly and do it the right way. Yeah, I feel like I, I always feel like DJs that take those risks wind up doing it for like a too long period of time, or they feel like maybe that's all they're going to play in their set, and they're not doing it in a way where they're like, all right, kind of set up the tracks correctly and then get out of them the right way as well. You can play those tracks that are being played at all of the festivals 
there's a way to get in and out of everything, right? Like I've had, I've had the strangest requests before. I'm like, oh, how the hell am I going to get in and out of it? And like you just find a BPM and something that's popular and all right, this is the way I'm going to get in and this is the way I'm going to get out and I'm going to get out with like a big pop song. And everybody, and if it didn't work, everybody's going to forget about that not working because you just played the fun pop song. You know right. what I mean? So it's, it's really setting it up correctly. Um, but what happens if it goes off too? Now well, now you have an extra song in, in your arsenal for next weekend. You know, so it's important to take those risks. But don't do it to a point where the ownership or management is going to realize what's going on. Yeah. You know, and because the crowd doesn't – the crowd, you can always get them back, I feel. Yeah. It, the crowds have just been so all over the place, you know. I, I just feel like there's it, – it, I've never felt more like every single night I go play that I – I don't know what I'm going to play because it really depends on who's there and everyone wants something different. And as a DJ, you have to try and make everybody happy and also make ownership happy at the same time. And it's, it's, it's been challenging. It's hard, especially in the summer when things are a little bit slower and the rooms aren't as jam packed. We always talk about, right. It's a lot harder to play those big EDM tracks on slower nights when the room's not that filled. It just feels weird. A three quarter full room. (laughs) Yeah. Um, It, it, it's, it's a weird time in nightlife. Like, it's a weird time. It just is. People people want to hear what they want to hear as for customers, and they want to hear it immediately in that moment. And one group of people might immediately want to hear one genre, and one group of my, people might want to hear a completely different genre immediately also. And it's like, how do you navigate that? It's it's hard. It's it's definitely a challenge. You're, you're ne- I think how you navigate it, first of all, mentally, is you're never going to appease everybody, you know, and especially at the rate that people want to be, um, that, that people want to be, uh, like, satisfied at, you know? Yeah. Like, I need it now. I want it now. And, like, with no, <laughs> with no compensation or anything. Um, but that's a, that's, a, that's a topic for a different time. But you're just, ne- you're just never going to do it. You're never going to play everybody's stuff at a time where they want it in a time frame where it's going to sound correct. It's just not attainable. We're getting away from we're getting away from being able to stay in in genres for 30 minutes. Like it, you just can't do it anymore. Because there's just too much like we always say there's too much accessibility to music and people have way too many different tastes. Um that's why I don't know if those like w- those single outside of artist sets, those single genre venues like they're just they're not going to exist. I mean, there's a lot less venues as is, right? Less venues, less people coming out. Things are just changing. The, the landscape of nightlife has changed a lot, especially since COVID, obviously. Everything changed during COVID. But coming out of COVID, it's like everything. You, you, everything's changed. You know, like even locally, Hoboken, right? Saturday nights in Hoboken, no matter what, have always been busy. Summer, spring, fall, doesn't matter. This summer, out of nowhere, Friday nights are really, really good in Hoboken, and Saturdays are slower. It's never been like that in the history of me working in that city. Yeah. And it's like, why is that happening? Who knows? I don't know. You know, it's it's. There's just a lot of things that are changing, and and when you don't know why things are changing, it's hard to adapt. You know. I think we spoke about this a few episodes ago, but we we do know that the younger generation is drinking less, right? We do know that because that that's on that's on live music venues radar. Uh, that's who came out with that article. Um, because they're, they're saying that a lot of those live music venues that rely on their bar sales are going to shut down over time. Yeah. Um, so that's going to affect our, our, uh, business as well. I mean, we can see that like the, um, non-alcohol spirits sales have been up incredibly this year. I I think that's in part to people having addiction issues coming out of COVID and then also pair that with, you know, healthy lifestyle has never been more popular. Yeah. You know, uh, you could say see it in the way people dr- just even from the way that people dress, what's popular in, in food culture, and then also kind of how people are consuming alcohol. Like just healthy living is, is is predominant. You know, especially in big cities, not so much in in smaller in, in smaller cities, um, and that's going to affect nightlife, right? Because not as many people are going to go out. If if I'm li- living a clean lifestyle, I'm not going to a nightclub. It's just not right. happening. Um, and we've always said, and this has been a big thing now for, you know, 15 years now, but, like, just the access of dating apps and the amount of dating apps. And do I need to go out to meet somebody? Like, that that affects it as well. So 
everything is playing against our industry. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I think there's one other thing, too. I mean, you could see it in sort of like uh, it just other industries where, you know, people aren't going into the office as much. People care more about having uh, – caring more about lifestyle and where they live and where they go out instead of like I have to work in the city and I have to make – $200,000 or more, and I have to do this. And people are, are, are looking more so for other activities than going and just spending money on, a, on bottles and getting dressed up. And like you said, everything, is, it, everything can now come to you, right? Like you can, be, yeah. you can stay home and, and get live stream or you can watch, you know, big festivals or shows on TV or on the internet or whatever. And I think when people are going out, they're looking for those experiences. Brooklyn Mirage, right? People want to go to the Mirage because it's an experience. You're seeing the best artists possible. They'll spend their money for that. People are going to like big food events or experiences more so than like, oh, let's just go to the bar or let's go to the club and spend a, a lot of money type it's, thing. It gets looked at as a huge waste of money. Right, like I'm going to this bar that's not giving me anything. Like the the service is half ass. The bartenders are in their phones half the time. The music's okay. The music could be very, very, very good, but the rest of the experience isn't very good. And it's like, well, what did I just spend 150 dollars for? Where I could have just spent 150 bucks to go to see some big DJ. Well, 150 and bucks just to like walk in the door and buy drinks. That's not even. That's not bottle service. Hell no. No, I'm just saying if you were just yeah, walking yeah. and buying drinks at a bar. I'm not saying a bottle. I'm not oh, even okay. saying a bottle service bottle service place. I'm saying like just like a regular, you know, bar that has a DJ late at night kind of a spot. Right. You know, like that's going to be a hundred to one hundred fifty dollar night, no matter how you cut it. Yeah. Between easy. your Uber, between your Ubers, if you go out to eat before, and you're definitely going to have some munchies afterward, and then all of your drinks, like it's expensive. And if you do that twice a week, it's expensive. So why not? So k kids are looking at it more like, why not go see? I don't know, name an artist at Brooklyn Mirage and spend spend my like one have my one big night out and have the experience. And I I think it's overlooked by a lot of bar owners that that's what's happening. That's what the landscape's turning into. And if you're not going to create the experience, then you know you're going to continue to lose money. Yeah. I think COVID opened people's eyes, right? You don't have to go out and do this. You could find other ways to have fun, and, and that's affected us for sure. I guess we won't really know what the effect is on the industry until we get five, ten years out, you know? It's going to be interesting. There's going to be a lot, of, uh, a lot of studies done, you know, from a five to a ten-year perspective we, we've we've hammered the fact home about like the venues that are successful now are the venues that do create that experience that do take the extra step that do focus on their customers and how the experience while on their venue is and it, the venues that aren't doing that aren't going to be around and 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 we're going to continue seeing less venues i think well you know what uh, i just thought about this point too in five to seven years when you know the 21 year old or the 20 year old that likes to go out and have that experience owns the bar well, that's when things will change. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the old ownership now that's not adapting. Well, at some point, the people that are going out right now will be the owners. So you'll have the experience, but we're just caught in the gray area right now. It's an interesting, so. it's an inter interesting conversation. I'd love to hear uh, some, other, some other takes for sure. So maybe we could, uh, we could have a larger scale conversation uh, on, on this particular topic, but... All right, I think this is a good pl place to wrap. Uh, let's promo tonight. If you are New York City, New Jersey local, we have our first Get Down DJs event. Uh, it's tonight at 7 p.m. at Mills Tavern in Hoboken, New Jersey. Um, you know, we have open decks. So if you're interested in showing the Get Down team your skills, we'll have sign-ups when you first walk in the door. Uh, we have DJ Drools with a little one-hour showcase. So that should be pretty dope. We're also live streaming the event, uh, so you'll be able to check it out. YouTube, Twitch, all these various platforms that we're going to be live streaming. Uh, and this is sort of a test run for us. So uh, we're, we're going to kind of work out some of the kinks on audio-visual and setting up the DJ booth in a different location and just creating a kind of cool vibe tonight. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, that should be great. Um We'll throw links for the live stream in our all of our socials, so be on the lookout in our stories. We'll throw it in there. Cool. All right, Gare. 
All right. Thank you guys for listening to this episode of The Get Down. Talk to you guys soon. All right, peace. Peace.